Welcome everyone to the January meeting of the Astrophotography Special Interest Group. It is fantastic to have you all here. We currently have uh, 65 people logged in on Zoom. Um, perhaps some of you have somebody with you, so we should have roughly over 70 people so far. And uh, that's pretty darn good for Astrophoto SIG meeting, and hopefully we'll have some more join us because the more the merrier. So uh, no delay tonight. Uh, we have a fantastic speaker. Uh, we're really excited to have him. And for the intro, we're going to have a fellow ASV resident and the person that suggested him as a speaker give the introduction. So, Mike Patton, please feel free to introduce our special guest speaker. I'll do that. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Tonight I'm talking to you from Arizona Sky Valley, which I'm sure almost all of you know is the home of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's remote telescope in, uh, in uh, Portal, Arizona. What you probably don't know though, is it's also the home of our speaker tonight, the seasonal home for our speaker tonight, Jack Newton. Um, and it should be of interest also that Jack is one of the founding principals of Arizona Sky Village and is responsible for the development of this area. A few things to know about Jack, I'm not going to get into all of his awards and stuff because it would take his entire presentation time, but he was raised in Winnipeg, Canada as a kid, and now he and his wife, Alice, reside half the year at ASV in the winter, obviously, and the other half in Osoyoos, British Columbia, where they manage a uh, astronomer's bed and breakfast. Um, Jack is one of the people who began his hobby in astronomy at a very young age and has continued, through it, continued with it his entire life. That would include all types and phases of technology changes with cameras, telescopes, filters, you name it. It's, it's made a tremendous change in his lifetime. Jack's first photos, he says, were at the age of 13. I, I'm guessing they're probably done with a hammer and chisel of Saturn. And it's continued to this day with all the different ways to capture sky, the skies with film, CCD, CMOS, still photos, videos, etc. Jack has been published in numerous publications, including the likes of National Geographic, for example, of the quality of the photos he's submitted. He's given talks all around the world, describing his experience and expertise in astrophotography. He's also co-discovered, and I think I got this number right because I got it today, of over 200 supernova, which is an incredible accomplishment. Uh, Jack's been invaluable in helping me uh, to learn astrophotography. And to this day is one of the go-to guys at ASV for technical advice. He's without a doubt the most dedicated astrophotographer I've ever met in my life um, and would go out each and every night if he could. I'm not gonna take up any more of Jack's time. So I'd like you to meet my neighbor, my friend, and my teacher, Jack Dude. Jack? Thanks, Mike. You're, you're coming across loud and clear. We need to, to go to uh, uh, your screen. Um, actually, we go down That's right. right here and click on that, there then we now we've got it and uh, we, can, uh, we can go from there. So, <clears throat> now this, I don't know, what is this set up? That's part of Zoom. That's part of Zoom? Okay. The, uh, all right. <clears throat> Well, that's, uh, we're talking about um, um, astrophotography and, uh, and uh, this really is uh, give you a, an idea. You got to first really find uh, uh, or build yourself solar observatories. So um, this is uh, 
a shot just showing a, a, an adult uh, double edelon uh, where we are today. And that goes with me and I'll set it up in, uh, in Arizona and, uh, and also we'll set it up down <clears throat> when we go back to Canada. And so it travels with me in the, uh, in the car and it's, it's been uh, all over the world actually. And uh, so I'm just going to, uh, <clears throat> the, as we're as we were saying, we're hunting for uh, for observing uh, sites, and uh, you've got to uh, also realize that the sun's playing an important part. I'm going to click through this. These are zodiacal, uh, zodiacal. Um, these are clouds that are lenticular, and they're uh, formed by high velocity uh, winds, and uh, Whip through this again. Uh, <clears throat> where uh, you're heading into uh, solar max, you're heading into uh, where you're going to get a lot of aurora, and uh, this is uh, uh, aurora in their uh, site in British Columbia, and uh, you can see uh, now this is unusual, and uh, it is uh, it's actually called Steve, <clears throat> Steve, and it's got nothing to do with, with the uh, Northern Lights. And uh, Steve, the acronym is Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. And uh, <clears throat> it was uh, basically, I think, uh, mostly discovered uh, by uh, the Royal Astronomical Society's Calgary Center. I could be wrong, but they uh, uh, they did a lot of work on uh, on that. Now, of course, uh, it's always nice to uh, photograph a, a little lightning. Uh, what they're telling us now is that fifty percent of the lightning comes out of the ground and goes into the night sky. So, if your hair is standing up in a storm, lie down on the ground. <clears throat> Now, here's the uh, uh, solar observatory um, in Canada with the, uh, with the <laughs> Edelon. And uh, that uh, is actually, uh, it's got two Lunt filters stacked and it's a half an angstrom bandpass. Um, so that's all the light that's, uh, that's getting through the, through the instrument. And, uh, this is now going back to uh, um, a solar max uh, when I was 30 years old. And so we're looking at a solar cycle of 11 years. Uh, and I'm 80 now. So uh, this is a, a, a solar max quite a while ago. This is called a, a solar prominence spectroscope. And that was my first really introdu introduction to... Uh, um, H alpha, um, because everything else that we were shooting through really was uh, was just uh, film of the sun and and sort of black and white and and color. But uh, this one allowed you to uh, to put a, a grading uh, of uh, thirteen thousand lines per inch, and uh, that gave you the uh, emission line of uh, of hydrogen, which allowed you to look at uh, prominences near the edge of the sun. You'd, uh, this would pl plug in and you'd adjust the uh, amount of uh, 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 opening um, at, uh, with this uh, adjustment screw. You've got uh, um, two binocular um, lenses and that makes the light parallel as it goes through and the uh, H-alpha line of the, uh, <clears throat> of the spectrum would uh, then be, you'd be able to center it and then view up here at the, uh, at the top end. And uh, let me just go to the next slide. These were two that I built back, uh, as I said, when I was 30 years uh, old and my first introduction to H-alpha uh, and photographing the, uh, the sky. 
um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, on the back of these is what they call a Herschel wedge. And that means that 99% of the sun's light uh, comes right through the back of the, uh, of the uh, prism or the, the wedge. And only, uh, you know, 100 to 1% comes up to your eye. And uh, <clears throat> I set this up in the morning and uh, uh, discovered a, a beautiful prominence uh, on the sun. And uh, so headed off to work and uh, being an eager beaver as it was, uh, I came back in uh, my lunch hour and of course I'm dressed in a suit and uh, I'm observing through the, uh, the eyepiece and, and centering up the, the uh, you don't touch the sun of course, you're looking at uh, just the, the edge for the solar prominence coming off the sun. And the, uh, my tie exploded and burned and uh, put me up into flames. And I was pounding on my, my chest, trying to get my, the fire out that uh, I had started by, uh, by looking through them. So they're quite dangerous devices, actually. And uh, it was my first wife that couldn't stop laughing. But anyhow, I'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move along here. There's... Uh, Alice, and uh, this is in, uh, this would be uh, two solar maxes ago, and uh, it uh, is our, uh, <coughs> our Florida Imaging Center, and we, we built this in, uh, I guess, actually, uh, um, uh, we did 99, I guess, uh, 2000, we opened the B&B in Canada, but uh, 99, we we built this uh, to teach astrophotography. And uh, this is the uh, observatory where uh, David Lunt uh, showed up with uh, his first Edelon <coughs> to give us, <coughs> give us uh, H alpha. And uh, he uh, arrived, that's David Lunt here, and I'm looking through his uh, telescope. But there's a kind of a funny story because he arrived with this uh, this Edelon and his and uh, and uh, he uh, on his with his telescope and uh, but uh, he wanted to see how it would work and how I would uh, judge judge his uh, his new invention and so I took it off or at least I I took it uh, off of his telescope and and put it onto mine and uh, I'm looking through there's nothing. Okay, and so I start unscrewing his uh, his uh, his uh, his uh, Edelon, and uh, by just uh, taking it on uh, on mine and tipping it and tilting it a little bit, I got the H alpha. And of course, he comes running over and says, "That's not the way this thing works." And I said, it "Better work this way, or you'll never sell one," because. Uh, everybody's telescope is going to be different. And so you need to be able to release the Adelon and uh, tip it and tilt it. And so we invented the uh, tip tilt for, uh, for solar telescopes. But uh, inter interesting uh, story. And that was at a solar conference uh, in Tucson, where we conceived the idea of uh, the Sky Village here. Now I've got, we're now jumping back in uh, in in time to uh, this would be I think um, this was uh, let me see. Yeah, this was uh, this was actually uh, um, taken with a uh, uh, a Pictor um, um, CCD camera, and uh, I was very fortunate because uh, I had uh, Santa Barbara Instrument Group send me the the new uh, chip that had just been invented and sent out to, to everybody, and uh, they sent me out one right away and. Uh, I was able to uh, to uh, 
hook it up and uh, took a, uh, a, a picture of the uh, uh, <clears throat> of the of the sun um, in H alpha, and uh, it uh, was uh, then colorized, or I colorized it. And I'll show you how to do that. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, it was uh, then um, put on NASA's website. And uh, then it was picked up from that and went around the world. And uh, here's a, another um, image taken uh, again with the uh, a single Adelon and uh, that you that you saw earlier. And uh, these were uh, actually uh, pictures that you you took. Uh, about a, a hundred or two, 200 frames. And uh, then they were uh, <clears throat> post uh, or colorized in Photoshop. And I'm just gonna whip through these. <clears throat> now, you'll, you'll uh, maybe off the photography, uh, uh, a little bit here in the sense that uh, this is uh, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> what we've what we've we've done is uh, uh, looked at uh, the uh, <clears throat> categories of planets that uh, that have now been ch totally changed, and uh, they've uh, they've put them into three categories. And this is the uh, Observer's Handbook, uh, which uh, I don't know. The uh, Royal Astronomical Society and has just brought uh, this out. And there's three categories of planets and that's all. And the first category is called planets. And it goes from Mercury to Neptune. And then the next ones are called dwarf planets. Now that's not politically correct because it should be mass challenge planets. Dwarf's not supposed to be used. Anyhow, they call them dwarf planets. And uh, there's about 24 of them in there, including Pluto. And uh, I think you've had Brown on and uh, he discovered a, a heck of a lot of them. And uh, so the, uh, they're called dwarf planets and uh, uh, there's about 24 or so, including Pluto in that grouping. And then the final one, um, they've gotten rid of asteroid and it does not exist anymore in the vocabulary of astronomers, period. Uh, they're called small solar system bodies. And so uh, I was fortunate enough to to have uh, the IAU uh, give us a, a, a planet, minor planet called Jack Alice. And uh, so now it's been changed to a small solar system body. And asteroid is gone, it doesn't exist in, the, in, the, in science anymore. Now I'm just gonna jump ahead here. This was uh, just a, a photography point of interest. This was, these are lensing quasars. And it was one of those shots that they took for a whole week uh, or longer from the sp space telescope and added them on top of each other. And so I got the coordinates for this uh, and I shot it with my telescope here. And uh, I shot about a five minute um, shot with, uh, this would have been my uh, uh, 25 uh, inch telescope and uh, the same feel. And uh, you can see that uh, um, these two galaxies here are these two galaxies. And this lensing galaxy is that, um, <clears throat> that little mark that you see on the, uh, 
of coming out of the uh, of the two. So those are the two, and there's the lensing mark right there. And uh, if you look at the some of the uh, uh, the other galaxies in the field, like these four galaxies or these four galaxies here in a row. And uh, so it's amazing what you can do with your own telescope um, shooting lensing quasars if you just uh, take the time to do it. Now, <clears throat> Life uh, Magazine, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is a, a photograph uh, that I took uh, on the uh, um, second, I guess, solar uh, solar solar max and uh, this uh, was a kind of an interesting story in that uh, I had the guests come to the B and B uh, and and in the morning we always open up and look at uh, stars in the daytime and uh, as well as uh, the sun and uh, I looked and there was two big solar spots right in the middle. And I thought, man, that's a direct hit for Earth. Um, but uh, they were they're just sunspots, uh, but they were spectacular. And uh, so about uh, four or five hours later, when the uh, people were booking in for um, the, the next night, um, and as they came at three o'clock in the afternoon, um, I said, before you do anything, come on up. I, I'm, I want to show you two sunspots that are spectacular. And so uh, I took them up and uh, I looked and there's a huge coronal mass ejection, which is this this uh, this white material you see um, coming off, uh, they've exploded. And I thought, oh gosh, I've got to get my camera and have a quick look and uh, I'll take a photograph of it. So I took a, a photograph of the, uh, of this, and uh, it uh, was picked up by Life Magazine and put in their uh, year end and pictures. And uh, when, uh, when they do that, they, they go back for the whole year and look at the best pictures that they put out that year. And uh, mine was selected as, uh, as one of those pictures and which I'm obviously very flattered about. And then, um, they had uh, Life Magazine did a uh, uh, a seventy year of uh, the greatest photographs in their from day one all the way up to present time, and mine was uh, selected to be the lead into uh, the uh, the science section. So uh, here's a Canadian astrophotographer getting. Uh, selected by Life Magazine to be in their uh, their 70th anniversary issue. And uh, so that was kind of cool. And uh, <clears throat> of course, the uh, nor Northern Lights we got because of that uh, eruption were absolutely spectacular. Now, going back to uh, solar photography, um, this again is uh, a movie a movie strip that you uh, you take, and uh, it, uh, this was uh, <laughs> again. The, I'm going back now to uh, the, uh, the solar solar max would be uh, um, the second solar max back which is uh, the, uh, <clears throat> anyhow, the, uh, uh, the er er eruption uh, again that I took, and this was with uh, um, a Mead uh, Pictor um, CCD camera. And uh, let me uh, maybe click this again. That's, uh, an image I took um, using uh, the, the uh, double Edelon. And uh, this was, uh, uh, I had to go to, uh, that's Venus sitting on the sun. And uh, you had to go to uh, Eastern, uh, 
U.S. And so I was in Washington, D.C. And uh, it, the, it just rose, the, the uh, sun just rose, cleared the horizon, and then Venus slid off the uh, sun. So, and I shot it in H-alpha so that you see the solar prominences and stuff that was on with that. Now, the <clears throat> National Geographic, uh, um, I should maybe mention a little bit about the, uh, the solar, uh, well, I was going to say the, uh, the um, solar images back then were taken with uh, the, the Pictor um, CCD camera and uh, very much the same as you do today. You, you run a uh, hundred frames or, or so, or a thousand frames, and then the uh, <laughs> the computer sorts them out. But uh, this was uh, again <clears throat> um, back in uh, the uh, so solar cycle that we uh, um, well it was in ninety nine. So it's uh, I guess uh, uh, two solar cycles back. Here is the, uh, the sun uh, where you put, put it all together to, uh, to do a composite. And uh, Alice uh, had said we had a, a great picture of a, a total eclipse of the sun. And Alice said, well, why don't you put the sun back? And so that's what we did. It became the best selling picture that I ever, ever produced. And uh, this is uh, again uh, back um, in uh, two, two solar max ago, and uh, Life magazine uh, picked this up as uh, their uh, their year end in pictures, and then it was uh, ultimately uh, <clears throat> um, printed in their. Uh, their anniversary uh, issue. That was a water bomber bombing our observatory in, in Canada. And now we're in the Arizona Sky Village. And uh, we've uh, <coughs> dri driven many miles north or so, I should say. And uh, that's the, the view of the uh, Cape Creek Canyon from our home. And there's the first observatory um, set up in the Sky Village. And uh, that's a solar observatory as well. And uh, this is <clears throat> pre present view. And uh, there's a picture of uh, three observatories, actually. We've got uh, this, this one was a solar observatory for some time and it's now going back to being one. And we've got uh, a telescope here dedicated for, dedicated for supernova hunting. And then the roll off roof right now, which has the solar scope uh, in it as well. And of course, uh, if you look down the road here, you'll see the one uh, with the two domes and that's David Churchill's site. And uh, you've already had him on as a speaker. And he has got some of the best photographs right now of the sun. Um, and you, you really should have a look at his site. And uh, I think, uh, has this been already been uh, pu published, uh, David oh, Churchill's site? I'm sure it has. The, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so that would be the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the one to look at. It's the state of the art. Uh, in, in present day technology. And here's the, uh, going back now to uh, when we just had a single Adelon and that was the uh, uh, produ produced by uh, uh, Mead uh, when they, uh, they bought out, uh, I guess, uh, no, it was before that. This was uh, going back to, uh, <coughs> 
going back to when my camera here uh, had the same chip in it as the Hubble Space Telescope. We got engineering chips that, uh, that they discovered in a drawer, and so they gave them out to amateurs to, uh, uh, to take pictures, and uh, that has the same chip as the Hubble Space Telescope. And the, <clears throat> the Edelon, again, uh, well, that's the max mount. And uh, so this now has uh, the Solar Max um, um, software, and uh, is the uh, is my uh, uh, solar scope. And uh, I'm just going to jump ahead. This was for supernova hunting, and uh, jump through this. Now, National Geographic, um, as soon as we opened the uh, Arizona Sky Village, um, the, uh, the newspapers picked up on what we were doing and uh, they, uh, <clears throat> we uh, were invited by the National Geographic to get a photographer out. And uh, he wanted, uh, there was quite a, a buzz about uh, astron astronomy village. And so I was um, standing in front of the observatory and uh, I guess, if I, can I move that now to go back previous? Um, they can see the rest of that, can they? Okay, the, uh, so you've got the dome over here and uh, I, I'm standing there to, uh, with a LED on my, uh, and we use our flashlights to paint the uh, during his uh, one minute photograph. Um, and he was the uh, National Geographic photographer, but we sort of had to coach him on how to take a picture at night. And uh, he did the Milky Way from Milky Way, which was kind of cool. Bed here. Whoop. Back again. Yes. Not much to do with photography, but this is uh, very interesting in that you've got uh, another rainbow, and I'm hoping you can see that. And it's uh, it's the mirror image of this one. This is a uh, uh, light that's gone uh, one through one raindrop and uh, broken into a spectrum and that's your primary and this one is uh, where it's gone uh, <laughs> through and uh, bounced inside the raindrop and it gives you a reverse image you'll see that red is on the left side and red is now on the right side so it's a mirror In fact, there's the uh, the rainbow, and this is Rick Spinnow's home here, and uh, that's an ash dome he's got up there. And uh, well, you know where the pot of gold is, and Rick's watching. Um, so zodiacal light. There's zodiacal light, um, and uh, there's the Milky Way, and they're uh, from our site here and uh, which is ex extremely dark comet shots and uh, this is uh, <clears throat> shots uh, Uh, now we, you're you're talking uh, about a uh, um, hundred uh, stack of about a hundred uh, shots. Uh, 
So go ahead here. Atmosphere. That's Mother Nature telling us it's going to be cloudy tonight. <laughs> a, a bit about super supernova hunting here. This is the roll off uh, observatory and uh, the two telescopes that work tirelessly every night, all night, hunting for. Uh, supernovas, and uh, these are some of our discoveries. One of the uh, most really significant one is called 2010-O, and I think it's, uh, I don't know if that's, uh, I think it's up one more that I can't see, 2010-O, and uh, that was uh, in a, <clears throat> a galaxy which is, uh, much interested to uh, the uh, <clears throat> the astronomers, uh, the professionals, and uh, uh, they gave me time on the Hubble Space Telescope to take a picture of that. And there's the uh, there's uh, my uh, discovery shot here, and this is Hubble's shot of the same uh, same field, or at least the this was the the old image and. This is my image, which shows the, uh, or sorry, the Hubble image of it showing the supernova. You can see the, uh, and that's the, uh, <clears throat> the original um, photograph that uh, was taken by Hubble and a write up here of the, amateur and professional uh, collaboration and so on. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, IAU uh, gave us a, well, it's a, an, an, an asteroid uh, which doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. Um, they, uh, <clears throat> they called it Jack Alice and 30840 and uh, the classification asteroid doesn't exist anymore in the vocabularies. The, uh, I can put that up. I don't know whether, can they see that? This is the uh, uh, observer's handbook and uh, the IAU now has come up with three categories for planets, and uh, the uh, the regular planets up to uh, Neptune are called just planets. But then you go, and the next ca category is dwarf planets. Now, dwarf I don't think is politically correct. It should be mass challenge planets, but we won't go there. Um, so dwarf planets is the next category. And there's uh, about uh, 24, 26, something like that, or 28. Um, and that would uh, in, include uh, all the Mike Brown, all, all his stuff. And uh, so they're, uh, and they're called small solar system bodies for everything else. And uh, asteroids does not exist. It's out of the vocabulary of uh, astronomers. And so that brings you up to date on, uh, on the latest in that category. Now, fortunately, we've gone through a period of, uh, of the deepest, darkest uh, um, solar cycle. That, uh, and uh, that's uh, 11 years of horror as we uh, were so deep in, in uh, the uh, in the solar cycle. And this is the solar uh, shot that uh, I took from uh, this, uh, <clears throat> from uh, Canada 
um, in July. And uh, you can see that the sun has finally turned on and we're now, um, it's just going to be fantastic what we'll be able to see um, in the coming weeks because we're definitely out of, uh, of solar max now. And uh, these are, uh, again, just streams taken with, uh, where's my, and uh, you're familiar uh, since you had, um, David Churchill, that's uh, the red, uh, and uh, that's exactly what I use now for astrophotography uh, of the sun, is uh, what uh, what David Churchill is is doing uh, from 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 his site, and we're doing the same thing here. So um, again, um, I'll show you how to colorize these in. Uh, they're just uh, um, strips of uh, about, uh, I don't know, a thousand images or a hundred images. And uh, there's another one. And again, this is all taken in November, or sorry, July of, uh, of this year. And we're shooting uh, um, from my observatory here uh, over the last uh, few weeks. And uh, here again, you, you can see the <clears throat> amount of activity that's on the sun right now. And uh, you guys already know how to do this. And there, of course, is, uh, is Alice, and uh, she's the, the driving force and love of my life. And uh, I could do 10% of what I do without her. And uh, anyhow, I think that's that. I want to go now. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, can we? Yeah, I can get into Photoshop, but just uh, yeah, no, that's what. Uh, no, I don't think you did. The play button. There, you can just hit resume share. Okay, so file and open. Okay, so we want to click on the TIFF file, and uh, so image just curves. So we've taken the black and white image, we brought it up, and it's now in RGB. And so what we want to do is to... Uh, Go down to the corner here. It's not the green, but here we go. Yeah. It's up there, right there. Yeah, so we drop down. And so what I want to do is to, you don't want to touch red. You, uh, you want to touch uh, green and blue. So as I slide that across, you'll notice that the colors start to, to change in the, uh, in here. And then slick, isn't that sweet? So you can 
just adjust those and uh, you can uh, get it to any uh, any color you want. And, uh, and that's how you or how you colorize pictures in uh, in Photoshop. And uh, <clears throat> you guys, uh, as I said, uh, um, are uh, doing exactly what I'm doing in uh, using uh, yeah. using uh, these cameras. And uh, this is. Uh, Zoo, and uh, this one's a uh, 224MC, and uh, it's a uh, just actually a, a workhorse now for doing your astrophotography. So, should we open this video up for questions? Yeah, absolutely. Let me um allow everyone to unmute themselves because I got a lock because I'm mean. But there we go. Everyone should be able to ask questions and we'll uh, stop the screen sharing here. And uh, if anyone wants to ask Mr. Newton a question, shoot away. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, why are a lot of the H alpha uh, images in yellow? H alpha is 656.3 nanometers, which is deep red. 700 begins infrared. So why aren't they in real color, which should be deep red? I'm always seeing a lot of them yellow color. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, because yellow makes it look pretty. <laughs> And well, the I, I think the deep red makes it look pretty too, and that's the science too, because it is 656.3, is it the deep red part of the spectrum? So you're absolutely correct. The uh, but uh, you're really as soon as you go into uh, um, the, uh, the world of uh, image processing, um, you're you're absolutely right. It's uh, it's uh, what sells images. And uh, if I had, uh, and uh, they're, uh, <clears throat> it, it should, it should be actually uh, bright. I think bright red is it? Not bright correct. Red, yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Newton. I'd like to ask you a question about your exposures of the sun. I use a Coronado sixty. I've had it for twenty years now. And it's still looking great. You have to expose one set of images for the disk and another set of images for the prominences. No, I uh, uh, I use uh, just one shot, and then you can uh, you can ma manipulate them in Photoshop. But you have a dual. And he has a single. Uh, break them apart, it then. Whether, whether it's single or whether it's dual. Uh, my my dual add-ons uh, are, uh, um, um, are, I guess, made by Mead, but was originally the, uh, the one from uh, Coronado. Coronado. And uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the, whether you're using a, a single or a, a double mine. If it was a single, it would be uh, um, uh, be an angstrom bandwidth, and uh, the uh, the doubles half an angstrom. And uh, angstrom is a vibration of a cesium atom, and it's half of that. So there's not much light coming through. Because okay. I notice on with my single stack that my disk is much brighter than what the prominences appear. And so therefore I can grab them with the new ZWO cameras, but I have to process the prominences differently than I do the disc to make them show up. Otherwise they, they are very, very dim. Yeah, 
no, and that's what Photoshop's for. I mean, you can do you can do anything with it. And uh, I agree. Thank you so much for that thought. Okay. Yeah, I've seen techniques both ways where people do single images like you and then do the, the two images separate and combine them together. But, you know, I guess whichever works for you, right? That's correct. Yep, everyone has their own techniques. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but I want to say thank you very much, Jack, for your excellent presentation. This is said from your old town. Yes, uh, Sid. Good to see your face, young face, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sid. And uh, I enjoyed all the years we had together. And uh, and uh, you were pretty faithful at coming to my observing sessions uh, way out in East Souk on top of yeah. Mount Matinson. Well, we, we, we miss that uh, options uh, these days, yeah. Yeah. Well, we anyway, good. Time. Thank you. I was the first guy to get the uh, the returning image of uh, of Halley and uh, the uh, the Polymars, uh, or he's a two hundred inch picked up uh, an image uh, about four months before uh, I did. I was the first amateur to uh, get a, an image of it, and uh, it was uh, processed by uh, the uh, astronomy department and. Uh, of the University of Victoria, yeah. and uh, they they sent uh, that image out, and they were able to actually get one the next night with their twenty four, and uh, so there was three uh, images: the one that um, the two hundred inch took, and our two images, and they did a course correction on Giotto um, with our data, and I didn't find that out, of course, till after, but. Uh, here we are, uh, and and they did. Uh, Giotto was very successful at uh, at uh, getting close, but uh, you never know when your images are going to be scientifically uh, valuable, like making a course course correction on a spacecraft. Yep. More questions or comments? I have a question. Sure, go ahead, Jeremiah. Um, I'm, I actually have a lunt, uh 50 millimeter here I put together, but uh, how much is it worth to get the double stack? I mean, would that be like something I would want to invest in? It's like as much as the scope itself. Um, would that be uh, <laughs> something that you would recommend? Um, I'm not sure with the, the new programs that are available. I mean, you're talking with... Uh, a guy 80 years old and had gone through three solar maxes. Okay. Um, and uh, it, uh, um, um, I, I was very happy with my, uh, my single Avalon, but having uh, the ability to, to have a double stack um, is a dramatic change, yes. Okay, yeah, I'll do it then. All right. <laughs> Lord, going to know. I, think, I think you just got Jeremiah in trouble, so. Uh, yeah, you slide that one past the wife, really, uh, after uh, some nice cocktails, I'm sure. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Hi, Jack. This is Christine from Oliver, BC. Uh, and Patrick and I are uh, listening to your great uh, uh, presentation, and we're sending our best regards to you and Alice. It's so nice to see you, and hopefully we will see you again very soon this coming summer. Love you guys. Fantastic. <laughs> Who's next? Going once. Going twice. All well, right. I'm another neighbor. I can say hi to Jack and Alice. I live about 50 <laughs> minutes north okay. of them in the Okanagan Valley. Alan Whitman. Hi, Jack. Oh, Alan. Yes. Alan, mm -hmm. hi. Been yeah. quite a while, actually. But uh, Yeah. Yeah. You're famous. Not quite as famous as you, Jack. 
<laughs> oh, I don't know. I like that picture on your back wall there. Oh yeah, that. Uh... Good that old was, Hale Bop. Uh, fine comment. That was uh, uh, Hale Bop, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Super. Well, thanks for calling in. Yeah, thank you. There's just several other people from the Okanagan here as well, I believe. But anyway, um, enjoyed your presentation, Great. Jack. Thanks a lot. All righty. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to thank you, Jack, for the presentation. If this is indeed your last talk, it is an honor that you gave it to the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing you again at Arizona Sky Village whenever I can get myself over there to uh, maybe do some work on the remote telescope or just uh, visit if I'm in the area. So again, well, everybody is always welcome. And uh, even though I'm going blind in one eye, I've got uh -oh. uh, and it makes it really tough uh, picking up uh, uh, faint detail. Um, and uh, of course, you get a bit goofy too when you. Yeah, you turn turn eighty and uh, yeah. And at any rate, it's been a great pleasure, and uh, I'm very proud to be associated with uh, your observatory here in uh, in the Sky Village, and uh, helping Mike out all the time. Yeah, we really appreciate your assistance in that regard as well. So you're certainly welcome to stick with us, but uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to the rest of the agenda here. Let's talk about some general astrophotography. Uh, first up, we'll talk about uh, new or new images from members. Um, so if anyone has any new member or new, new images to share, um, I, I have a few old images that I wanted to share that I've recently reprocessed. But if anyone has any new stuff they want to share first, go right ahead. Pete, I know you got one, you bastard. <laughs> I was muted. How bad? Um, <laughs> yeah, I finally got around to processing my M1 data. Um, I've been collecting since the fall. Let's see if I can share my screen. You should be able to. Yeah, this is taken with my my 12 inch uh, F4 Newtonian um, process and picks insight. Um, H alpha obviously is buried in there. Um, it's quite a bit of data, actually about 16 or 18 hours worth at F4, so kind of sucked into light, but I was pretty happy with this. I was surprised when I, all the individual frames didn't look all that great, but once I got it all put together, it was definitely worthwhile processing it. Very good, Pete. That is fantastic. Thank you. Pretty soon here, I'll enter Mumbauer's address in the chat, and you can go to his house and just beat him up for taking that picture. I, I, <laughs> I got a baseball bat ready for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> Anybody else have any new stuff to share? I know we have the uh, great Michigan permacloud over us, but uh, if anyone re re recently processed some stuff, go ahead. So this was from back in October. Oh, okay. So this is um, obviously the Elephant Trunk Nebula. Ah, very good. Processed um, or in the show palette. Um, we took it over three nights. It's about 21 hours of integration. Um, equally split between um, sulfur, H-alpha, and oxygen. So this is, this is the last thing I've process um i have some more data but i've really been helping to add to it but you know the weather has not been cooperative as, as we also hear this time. well that's great all right thank you lloyd anybody else got any stuff to share i didn't image it couldn't couldn't get the camera working but the uh second time my uh 14 inch saw starlight I was able to observe, I got collimated finally, able to observe the third brightest or the second brightest ZTF comet, the one in Cassiopeia. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. No that's observing not... reports here, Dave. We, we, we share images only. <laughs> I hear you. That, that's general meeting stuff. All right. Um, I wanted to share some old stuff because uh, hopefully my sharing screen's going well here. You, some of you know I've been having issues with that uh, lately. But uh, I, I shared this during astrophotography night. 
And this is, of course, NGC 891. This is taken with the remote telescope. It's uh, 14 and a half hours of data. Uh, but what I wanted to show you, uh, you know, Pete had to open when he shared the picture of M1 is uh, last month we talked about R Russell Croman's Blur Exterminator. And so I, I tried it on some of the images that I shared during Astro Photo Night and just, just discovered how remarkable uh, that little bit of uh, software for PixInsight really is. So here's the before image, the one I shared back in October. And here is the after shot. So I can go back and forth here. For some reason, the, 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 the background seems to have changed on me a little bit, but notice how the stars are a little smaller and a lot sharper and more, uh, you know, more aesthetically pleasing. So before, after, before, after. So it did a really, really great job on reducing the stars. It didn't really do much for the galaxy, but maybe if I used it earlier in the processing flow, it, it would have uh, saved me some trouble from sharpening the galaxy. I did try to sharpen, uh, uh, do the same thing with NGC 4565, which I don't have to share. But uh, that sharpened the galaxy to the point to where it just looked horrendous. And so I said, ew, gross, and just closed it and moved on. Uh, but then um, here's the image of the Crescent Nebula. This was taken from OWL Observatory using Nona, which is our Teleview NP101 that rides piggyback on the Ashby telescope, which is a 16-inch uh, Schmidt on an astrophysics 1600 mount. And of course, we're looking right into the Milky Way and Cygnus here. So it's just crowded with stars, which kind of overwhelm the picture here. And uh, of course, you can see the nebulosity. You can see the crescent nebula and the either the background or foreground nebulosity, probably a little bit of both in there. But the stars just kind of overwhelm it. But then I took a uh, blur exterminator to it. And uh, there you go. So again, there's before, after, or after, here we go. <laughs> My time went a little off. Before, after. So the after shot, I think, really, really improves the image. And I was really, really happy with the way uh, this turned out. So uh, if you do have PixInsight and have not yet got uh, Blur Exterminator, I really, really recommend it. I know Mumbauer has had great success with it from the M1 shot there, but uh, boy, it's really helped my uh, pictures there. So I, I have uh, one that I'd be willing to share. Um, oh, great. We'd love to see some, it. Some of the solar here that we've been doing. All since right. We had one day of sunshine in the last three months, I'd say. But uh, I got this, this one. Let me share the screen. Uh, right there. So that's uh, that's my image of of the sun with the CRJ that I work on, actually flying right across it from my front yard. And uh, we call that NGC seven four seven. Well, it's the Canadian version, I guess. Right? <laughs> it's a small little little uh, regional jet that we uh, we fly in and out of here. So. That's uh, but that's something nice that I actually got a, a chance to use my lunch finally, and uh, it was seventy images and stacked it and came out uh pretty decent for a first time, I think. Very nice. Let me. And where are you located, Mark? I'm in uh, Mishawaka, Indiana. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, let's not share. So that's All what right. I got. Well, great. I'm glad someone, uh, at least in the area, got to do some solar imaging because uh, it's been hard with all these great sunspots not to be able to get out and, and image the sun or at least observe it. I have not seen any of these big sunspots. Yeah. So. All right. No. Um, anybody else have anything to share before we move on here? All right. So let's go ahead and move on. And as always uh, on the agenda, I always like to... Uh, uh, ask people to share, or I have some to share, images from other astrophotographers that perhaps you've seen over the past month. And over the past month since we last met, I have seen some really, really good images uh, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, let me make sure I'm on the right setting here. What's that? I was just say I have one to share. Okay, so let me share these. Uh, per, uh, hopefully it's not the same one that you have to share. I'm sure it is. 
Okay. So here's the first one, of course. Um, if you uh, check out a pod every single day, like I do, uh, you probably saw this image. So this is from January 10th, 2023, if you want to find it. And this is with a 24-inch plane wave. They call it the CDK 600 because it's on their uh, large mount as well, I, I, I assume. So I just found this to be a really, really impressive image of the cone nebula. We can just kind of scroll down and look at the whole thing here. And you can see it, uh, it's by a gentleman named Matthew uh, D Dietrich. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. I'm sure I butchered that a little bit. I can say it in my head, but I can't say it uh, uh, um, verbally there. So um, unfortunately, he has just a really, really tiny image on, on Instagram. And you can uh, find out more about it here. So you can see uh, it's roughly a 24 hour exposure with uh, a, a hydrogen alpha luminance, red, green, blue filters that he uh, combined together. But of course you can go back here and just kind of click on the image. Internet's running a little slow, it looks like. I got, I got a question, uh, Richard. Yeah. Um, one of our last uh, speakers uh, mentioned that uh, these uh, star, st um, you know, the, those uh, four, four, scattering uh, thing that indicates a star, but uh, how come the other ones don't show it? You I'm know, that those are uh, the stars. Uh, I mean, the scattering, you know, I think the, it's a, it's part mean, of the scattering like that. Yes. yes. Like, like the spikes? Yes. That's, yes. that's caused by the uh, spider vein that holds the secondary mirror. So refractors yeah. don't have that because refractors so, so, don't, don't have that, but, you know, um, Plane waves so the, do, Newtonians yeah. do, but Schmitz don't. So yeah. Schmitz, Schmitt so, caster grains don't have them. Yeah, the the other other, other white dots uh, which don't have uh, th that pattern. Oh, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. It only really picks up on the really bright stars, not so much the fainter oh, ones. Oh, okay, okay. Yep. Thanks. So I just so I just found that to be a uh, really really impressive image of the cone nebula there. And the next, um, as usual, the, the zoom controls get in the way. Oh, now they're gone. But let me click on the next one there. Uh, this one just blew me away. This is just an astounding panorama of the Milky Way. It doesn't show the entire Milky Way like, say, Axel Mellinger did, and, and at least some others have done since then. But this is a 250-panel, uh, 90-hour exposure of the Milky Way by uh, not just one amateur, but several. Uh, amateurs uh, were in Nambia, La Palma, and Central Europe. And they all combined their images uh, to create this mosaic here, which is just incredible. And you can see they used uh, Canon EF 135 millimeter and Sam Young or Rokinon, uh, 135 millimeter lenses with various Canon cameras like the uh, modified uh, uh, EOS R, uh, modified EOS RA. Of course, those are the mirrorless cameras. Oh, stop. Go away. I'm, I'm not going to buy anything. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, a Sony uh, camera as well. Boy, I got to watch the pointer there. They're, they're trying to get you to buy stuff. And you can see they used uh, Ioptron Skywatcher mounts. And uh, if you scroll down here, of course, you can read the entire process of putting this image together and they even have this link here which i'm not going to bother to go to if you want to buy a print and usually i don't like to buy prints from others i prefer to try to take the picture myself but man i'll never be able to take anything remotely like this so i'm tempted to get a print and stick this sucker on my wall so i uh, th th it's just a remarkable image of the milky way and then um, this made uh, a bit of a new bit, a bit of news is there is a new discovery, a, a new nebula around the Andromeda galaxy. So we can scroll down here and there's our old friend M31. This, of course, is in hydrogen alpha O3. Uh, I'm not sure if they used any other filters here. The, the, the data is in this, in this image, but the discovery is this thing here, this, this blue arc. It, it almost looks like a reflection nebula but it's not. Uh, this is basically a cloud of oxygen that they can only pick up with an O3 filter. And this was discovered by um, uh, various amateurs, uh, uh, pretty much all from Europe, I believe, Xavier uh, Strautner, Marcel, uh, 
Dursler and Yana Santi, um, to, you know, uh, either took the image or, or processed the image and, and made this discovery that nobody ever saw before. You know, people have taken deep images of the Andromeda galaxy before and saw all this red nebulosity, but no one's ever seen this thing before. So it, it was a complete discovery that you need O3 filter and uh, basically tens of hours of exposure. And so maybe with the remote telescope, we'll have to try to look for this thing. And, you know, when they first discovered it, they thought it was uh, maybe some kind of funky artifact, you know, not real. So they had another amateur, uh, Bray Falls, who has been making a name for himself in the astrophoto circles. Uh, and he also imaged the same thing. I don't know if we can see the whole thing here. If I can get it to go. Yeah, the O3 was 45 hours of exposure. Yeah, that's just crazy. Oh. Yeah, it's really it's really neat on uh, Dramada because you can see some of the real faint, especially uh, uh, just to the left of the core, some of the jets that are coming out in O3. It's yeah. a remarkable image when you see it high res up close. Yeah, so people are wondering, is this thing local or is it part of the Andromeda galaxy? Because if this if this is part of the Andromeda galaxy, it's you know it's huge. It's tens of thousands of light years across, but. I tend to still favor the idea that it's local, that maybe it's a remnant of a planetary nebula or a supernova remnant, but we'll, we have to wait for spectroscopy on this thing to know if it's local or not. That'll reveal it pretty quick. But is, is this the jet you're talking about, Pete? Yeah, that and just to the left yeah. too. Yeah, I didn't notice that before. Oh yeah, there, there's this funky feature here. Yep. Yeah. That looks like it's local, but yeah, I, I didn't quite notice the jet before. I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, th they believe the jet is part of M31 for sure and the uh, other stuff, but that big, yeah, it's up for debate on that big one. And it doesn't look like it's centered on where the supermassive black hole would be. You would expect the black hole to be down here. And mm -hmm. so I'm not, it's odd if the jet's related to the black hole. How come it's so off center? That's, that's unusual. Hmm. Interesting. Well, there you go. There are some of the really cool images that I've seen over the past uh, month. So, Lloyd, you said you had one to share. Did I take your thunder away? Yep. Oh, <laughs> I'm, so I'm sorry. I, I, think, I think that this was uh, also on the NPR news. I heard about it. Yeah. Of course, and then in NPR, you can't see it. So there it is. Uh, yeah, I, the I guy, also the have guy one. explained Richard. it. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. All right. Any other images from other amateurs that anyone managed to uh, share and or find that you well, wanted to share? Yeah, I'd like to show you one from uh, near Mount Denali. From uh, there's a friend of my wife's who daughter and her husband have a dog sled business near Denali, and they have this picture of the Northern Lights. Oh, cool. Can you see it? Not yet. Nope. Did you go to the share screen and pick the picture? Uh, okay, hold on. Sh oh, yeah, there you go. How about now? It's coming. There we go. Oh, very good. She, her, I don't know what her married name is, but... Uh, her name when I knew her here in Kalamazoo is uh, Casey Monroe. Uh, whoever does, that all, I think, you know what? Whoever goes for both picks, that's a, that's a plus. Yeah. Yep. It's a plus. Is, is that all? But don't do the lens. You ready? No. No. Oh, you can do the lens. I don't know. Which, but it, which, all yeah. those girls. Are like, oh. Okay. It looks like we're picking up some uh, background conversation there. So we're going to mute everyone. So you'll have to unmute yourself to say anything. <laughs> So yeah, Don, that, that's a great image. I really like that. Okay. Anybody else? Again, you'll have to unmute yourself because we, we had some conversation there we didn't need to hear. I just Wait. put the link uh, <laughs> to the I just put a link to the chat. Uh, it's oh, about yes. the B BBC. Uh, there was an article about the light light pollution um, in case uh, we see that. All right. Uh, let me refer. I, so Forbes had a nice uh, uh, ter ten terabyte image of the Milky Way galaxy two days ago. 
nice article about uh, uh, galactic plane, a nice image. Great. Uh, let's see, there's one more th um, for next thing here. Let me uh, fire this up. Uh, so let's move on to uh, new astrophotography related equipment and software. So uh, I did make a new purchase uh, over the past month since we last met here. And it's all Kevin's fault. So I've been wanting to purchase one of these for a while. I'm waiting for this program to start up here so it gets out of the way because I was going to share that too because I never heard of it before, but it's taken its sweet, sweet ass time. And uh, so um, I was talking to Kevin and told them I wanted to make this purchase, but OPT has been on back order uh, of them for a long time. And then he mentioned Agena has them in stock. And so, so I went to Agena and just, uh, you know, my, my wallet just flew out of my pocket. And uh, the credit card just basically swiped across the machine somehow, and uh, and it came in the mail. So I got one of these. It's still in the box. There we go. So uh, many of you know, uh, back in October, during the SIG meeting, I shared the new mount that I bought. I bought the, the, the Skywatcher Star Adventure GTI because I've been trying to get uh, put together a really portable uh, setup that I could take anywhere uh, when I don't want to drag out the Mach 1 or even when I feel like driving out to, say, the Nature Center to use the scope out there. So um, I'm eventually going to use that, uh, you know, use this thing with my little uh, iPad here, which you, which uh, is really, really bright. And uh, so now I don't need to uh, use my laptop to control my uh, setup that I'm building. So I still need... Um, of course, I don't really own a ZWO camera, but the club has a ZWO uh, ASI 294 that we loan to members that no one's used yet. But so, 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 so I kind of hoard that here for myself. And um, but I need to get a ZWO auto guider because my Orion um, auto guider will not work with the ASI Pro. So if anyone maybe wants to buy my Orion auto guider, uh, it, it's yours for maybe a hundred bucks or so. <laughs> So, so there's my shameless plug. And the other thing um, is absolutely free. I saw a video of this pop up on YouTube, but it sounds like it came out uh, last spring, like around March or April of last year. So, of course, if you have Pix Insight, you probably use the uh, dynamic background extraction, you know, DBE. Uh, but this is a free version of a dynamic background extraction called Grexpert. And uh, I, I, I don't have any samples to share because I haven't tried it yet, but I did download it just to look at it. And uh, it looks like a really intuitive uh, uh, bit of software to use. So again, you can download Grexpert. You know, they're kind of ripping off the Russell Crowman uh, naming scheme there. He should probably consider suing them, but that's okay. Uh, so uh, you can download Grexpert for absolutely free. And some people say it's better than Pix Insights uh, dy dynamic background extraction. But, uh, you know, some say it's uh, pretty much the same thing. So if you don't have Pix Insight but would like some kind of device or software to help uh, uh, smooth out your backgrounds, get rid of that nasty gradient from light pollution or whatnot, uh, you, you could try this out because, again, it is absolutely free. So has anyone heard of Grexpert before? This is the first I've ever heard of it. So some of you have heard of it and haven't, haven't mentioned it, so you're terrible. <laughs> I, need, I, I need images to work with it. <laughs> Well, you could try it on old stuff and compare. Yeah, I will. It's on my list of things to do. All righty. Anybody else have any new stuff to share? New equipment, new software, perhaps you got for a gift over the holiday season? I got uh, a new Feather Touch focuser for my Lunt, uh, which is pretty nice. <laughs> oh, sweet. Yeah, it's very smooth. Um, and you're going to love that ASI Air. Yep. All right, cool. Yep, I know David uh, Parks has one. I've seen his in action. But I have not. I've been so busy, I haven't even taken it out of the box yet. So it, it still even has the shrink wrap around it. I can't. I see that. <laughs> you, you, you can see it glistening in the light there. So I've got like four ZWO cameras if you want to um, mess around with one of them or something. Sure. All right, cool. 
I'm still working on my setup, though. It's not quite ready yet, but uh, got to have money. All right, so we'll, we'll go ahead and move on here. Um, since this is uh, the January meeting, I'm curious to see if anyone has any astrophotography plans for 2023. Do you plan on traveling anywhere? Uh, do you, uh, you know, head to a, like a dark site somewhere in Michigan or across the country or anyone going to a star party or anything? Anyone have any plans yet? Wow. Pete, where are you going? Me? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about the Texas star party. Woohoo. Got an email about it. So I did too. Yeah. So I might do that. They do limit it to 500 people now, you know, back when you and I went, of course, we didn't go together, but back in those days, you know, there are like 700, 750 people and it was crowded. Yeah, uh, I know your neighbors. Yeah, but now they limit it to uh, 500, so it's a little more manageable. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to buy a smaller scope. I'm not going to drag the 12 inch out there. Oh, you wuss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're healthy, do it. Ha. Huh. Well, if you're nice to me, maybe I'll let you borrow the Mach 1. Oh, I'll, I'll take the 1100 out there. I have no problem with that. I think it breaks apart in two pieces. Oh, okay. All right. So it's, it's a scope that bothers you. You can't, you can't. Did you get your carbon fiber tube yet? No, it's shipping from Germany uh, next week. Oh, wow. Okay. So that that's that's good news. Yeah. Then I'll get all the new moonlight on there and all, all, the, all the stuff I've been ordering the last few months. I'll have something put together. Great. Then it'll be cloudy. All right. Who else has some astro photo plans for 2023? I've got the uh, Michiana astrophotography or uh, astronomy. Um, what do you call it? Uh, we do the the star party for for uh, TK Lawless for May. It's like May 19th through the 21st, I think. Right. The Michiana star party. I gave and, a talk and, there right before COVID. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're back. So we did it last year and we had one good day and one day of cloud and rain. So that sounds like we'll a star party in Michigan. Yes, it is. That's that's why I never did one. <laughs> is that the Niag Fest or a different one? No, Niag Fest is ancient history. It's gone. Oh. It's it's been it's long gone. Oops. I think the last one was 2004. Yeah. The good old days. Yeah, the good old days, if you can call it that. So we got the Michiana Star Party. I, I haven't been to the. I haven't been there at night, but I, I gave a talk there. Excuse me. Could you uh, post the Greg's per, uh, site again? Oh, I, I'm sure. I, yeah, if somebody else can post a link to Grexpert, that'd be great. But of course, uh, Google is your friend. <laughs> oh, that'll take me there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. How, thanks. How do you spell that? G R A X P E R T. Thank you. Yep. Grexpert. I feel I feel like a bell should go off and I advance in the spelling bee. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, moving on here. Hopefully uh, you'll come up with some plans and people can share them in the future. So uh, looking to get out to do some uh, imaging. But, um, you know, we have uh, two meetings left after this one. So... It's time to maybe start uh, thinking in your head what speakers or topics do you want for the next season of the Astrophotography Special Interest Group? Because the only reason we did another season this time is because people either volunteered like Pete or Lloyd uh, or Agapios or you recommended speakers like Mike, Pat Mike Patton recommended Jack Newton and then... Um, some uh, somebody else got recommended, but I can't remember who. <laughs> but uh, I only had to find speakers for the first one in October and the last one in March. But I should mention October was really hard because it took me six freaking times to do it. But that's neither here nor there. But uh, this is not like the general meetings where usually I, I just find everybody. I, I expect a little more input from people. So uh, you can maybe start looking on YouTube, start looking at other clubs, Astrophoto SIGs, and look for good speakers. So we're, we're looking for recommendations. If I don't get any, that's it. The SIG's done because uh, I'm not going to do it all by myself. So I'm just looking for programming ideas. 
All right, so let me give everyone a couple updates. We'll, we'll start with the KAS remote telescope. It's mostly good news, thank, thank goodness. Uh, so, you know, our online viewing session season uh, has not gone very well because, uh, number one, the mount was broken. Uh, we had an uh, issue with the USB port on the MKS 4000 circuit board on the Paramount ME2. And we called uh, Software BISC uh, to see if, number one, they could repair the circuit board. And they said flatly, no, we don't repair them. Uh, you can buy a new one for 1500 bucks, but guess what? They're on extended back order because of the chip shortage. So we figured we can either wait for a new board. We even held a board meeting, which is kind of a double meeting there, board about the board. And... Um, and we uh, actually approved the funds to purchase a new one for $1,500. But we realized we're going to be waiting a long time to get the circuit board. Maybe we could find someone to fix it. So some of the members were like, well, maybe I could try it. But I wanted to find someone that said, absolutely, I know I can fix it. And so I had an idea that was kind of also the idea of Kevin Jung, because he had the same idea that I did. Why not call Jeff Dickerman at Optech in Lowell, Michigan? Because Jeff is a KS member. At least I, I think he still is. <laughs> he might have to renew. And, uh, you know, they, they work with very fine um, electronics. You know, they, they make some really high-end equipment. So I contacted Jeff and he said, no problem. Send it to us and we'll get it fixed. And guess what? They fixed it. Not only did they fix the USB port, but they discovered there was a blown capacitor that they replaced as well. Uh, and we didn't, even, we didn't even know about that. So uh, they repaired it. They didn't have any way to test it. So they sent it back to Mike Patton at Arizona Sky Village. Uh, he and Jim Kurtz got it hooked up. And a few nights ago, I tried to connect to the telescope. And guess what? It worked. So the remote scope is back. It's back, baby. It's back. And now that the scope is, uh, now that the mount is back up and running, uh, the next goal was to uh, get that new focuser working for the Takahashi. Um, you know that we purchased a uh, Moonlight Nightcrawler WR35, the big one, uh, focuser for the Takahashi. And uh, Jim got that installed. It looks really, really great. Um, I tried to focus last night, but I think they might have one or uh, one too many or perhaps two too many extensions on it because he, he was past focused. So I so I could I could bring the tube out, which just made it less and less focused. So hopefully maybe tonight if I have time, um, I'll fire up the remote scope again and see if I can get the uh, moonlight uh, trained uh, and working with the Takahashi. But once I can get that done, I'll, I'll contact everyone that's uh, currently subscribed to use the remote telescope, and I'll contact those that have to renew. Because remember, uh, you know, we only charge 50 bucks a year to use the remote telescope. If you wanted to use this um, remote facility in Chile, they have a 17-inch plane wave that they advertised on Astromart recently. We worked that out to like uh, $87 a day a day and you can use the remote scope where it's been spectacularly clear lately for 50 bucks a year so if you use it for one night you get your money's worth for the remote telescope so i'll be encouraging uh many of you again to to sign up and use the remote telescope i mean your your uh subscription fee barely pays for the uh software renewals so it doesn't really pay for the new equipment that we've been purchasing like a moonlight focuser. So every little bit helps. Uh, if you just don't want to use the remote telescope, you can still give us money. You can still make donations. So that's always wonderful. And then um, moving on to Owl Observatory, which of course has seen very little use because it's Michigan. And it's the winter. So uh, we probably won't be out there too much until at least spring. but um, since I can share my screen again and not crash and burn, uh, here is the Leonard James Ashby Telescope webpage on the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society website. And all you have to do is go to the OWL Observatory tab and go to the Leonard James Ashby Telescope. And we'll scroll down here. And here's the Ashby Telescope with the Astrophysics uh, 1600 on the 16-inch with our 4-inch Teleview. 
Now, the Teleview is the thing of interest this month because if you scroll down further, you'll see the first thing listed under the equipment is our Coronado Solar Max 2 90 millimeter hydrogen alpha filter. No, we don't have another filter to do double stacking because that's really expensive. And uh, but we do have this extremely nice H alpha filter to image the sun. It threads right on to the Teleview here. That's kind of why we got the, the Teleview because there's no adapters needed. And uh, scrolling down further, you can see we have this really nice camera. Yeah, we got the color camera for planetary imaging. Maybe one of the one of these days we'll get a monochrome version uh, for uh, that's better for solar imaging. But you can use this to image the sun uh, from the Kalamazoo Nature Center. Um, you just have to take the basic OWL Observatory training course. And uh, it, it, we, we have a laptop out there, of course. The only thing you need to bring is maybe a portable hard drive to download your massive... Uh, video files, but uh, if you got inspired to do some solar imaging from Jack Newton, we have the stuff to do it out at the Nature Center. You just have to have uh, clear skies. All right, so are there any other astrophotography related items that anybody wanted to share? Stuff that's not on the agenda. Nope, I just remembered I bought something. Oh, you bought something. Yeah, Sounds it's an great. More cloudy skies. Yep. It's just an I. Well, I actually already have one out in my observatory, but it's a it's a switch that you can control through a web page to turn off and on your outlets. Um, I got a lot of stuff I want to turn on and off, I guess. So, yeah. but it's really nice just going there, and you can actually schedule it up so like my um, dehumidifier turns on at seven a.m., shuts off at ten a.m., and it usually drops the humidity down. But it's a pretty cool little device for about one hundred and fifty bucks on Amazon. Yep, we actually have two of them for the remote telescope. The first one burnt out, we thought, but we got it fixed. And so, yeah. we, but we purchased another one, and so, so we have like the new one, and we have like a backup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, their support's great. Mine burnt out like three years after I bought it, and I emailed them. They're like, "Oh yeah, send it back. We'll fix it," and they did. So now I got a backup. Huh? Now I can I, plug I, more. I, I don't think that'll cause clouds. I don't. I don't. I don't think uh, internet power strips cause clouds. I, so I, I think we're safe there. That's why I was kind of hesitant on sharing it. I just heard the word equipment and immediately okay. went to clouds. I mean, it has to have optics, right, to, to cause clouds. So I don't, I don't think this has optics, of course, so it doesn't cause clouds. So I don't yeah, know. But, I don't know. It has PhD in there or the, the, rip, the or offshoot of PhD. The ripped off version, as we learned last year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. It does. Anybody got anything else before we uh, sign off here? All right. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for the January 2023 Astrophotography SIG meeting.